This next session, we're going to welcome and hear from two globally recognised, highly successful entrepreneurs. Both of them vocal on climate action and both of them demonstrating their commitment by investing in green energy and clean technologies. The first of our entrepreneurs is here in Sydney or New South Wales. He's the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian and Grok Ventures, Australia's own Mike Cannon-Brooks. Mike, good morning. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good. Great, thanks. Mike, you've been in the press a lot and you've spoken uh, extensively about the decarbonisation opportunity that we have here. You know, it's been the focus of our discussions for the last day at Impact X. Share some of your thoughts on the promise of Australia um, and the opportunity of becoming a renewable energy superpower. Uh, sure. Look, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Australia has one of the largest economic opportunities in the world in the decarbonisation of the planet. And we should understand that, right? Uh, we also have a huge risk. We are one of the most vulnerable countries and economies to the nature of climate change. So if we don't transform our economy fast enough, not only are we at great risk uh, from our traditional industries, uh, whether that be fossil fuel exporting or whether that be agriculture, we also lose out on those opportunities because the time to take those opportunities is in the next decade um, we could be, uh, as I've called it many times, right, a, a renewable energy superpower. We have lots of land, we have lots of smarts, uh, lots of talent, we have lots of financial capital in Australia, and we have three billion consumers to the north who need our cheap renewable energy. Um, we, we just have to uh, organise um, industry, uh, which is trending in the right direction and the federal government towards uh, understanding that opportunity and, and embracing it, right, as, as the, you know, the biggest economic growth opportunity for Australia in the next 10 plus years. Indeed it is. So let's embrace it. You know, we've also been talking about the role that individuals and business and government have to play in this decarbonisation opportunity. So let's embrace it. Let's, let's really tackle this head on. Uh, Mike, also reading in the press that you and your wife have pledged $1.5 billion to climate change. Um, what do you see your role as, as a leader in this space and someone that's, that's taking the family balance sheet and putting it behind climate technology and climate advocacy? Look, I think... Um, I'll state my position carefully here. I think the individuals can make choices I don't think individuals should be made to feel guilty for the situation we're in. Um, sometimes yeah. it's a, uh, a feeling of guilt that's put onto individuals. I do think, uh, especially people fortunate like myself, have an uh, opportunity to, to yeah. show leadership, I suppose, in, in driving that. So, yes, we announced our um, Green Pledge um, not to fight climate change, I would say, to fight climate change urgently. Yep. So the part of that pledge was to say that it has to be uh, donated, uh, spent, invested by 2030. So in the next eight years, this isn't over the next 29 years we can do something about it. This was uh, a large amount of money, one and a half billion, to try to keep the world under one and a half degrees by 2030, uh, but to do it in the next eight years, right? Um, we've done a lot of work on the Alaskan business side to make sure we're uh, world's best practice about how a large corporation can uh, behave and um, show itself. Uh, and I think on a personal level, um, there are a lot of individuals that could, uh, you know, copy that plan. Yep. And uh, we need financial investment. We also need philanthropy. We need both of those sides of the coin uh, and we need it urgently, right? We need, as the tagline for Glasgow is raising our ambition and raising our urgency. Uh, yep. We're trying to uh, show an example of how to do both. Yeah, we're, there's a bunch of entrepreneurs here. We're impatient people. So let, let's get moving with this. Thanks, Mike. I'd now like to introduce the next global entrepreneur, a very familiar face to all of you, and here's a short video to introduce our next speaker. I'm a person that looks forward more than looks back. When I started 50 years ago as an entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur I don't think existed. I think an entrepreneur is somebody that creates something that makes a positive difference to other people's lives. As well as buying the latest hit record, you'll be able to get an air ticket to New York from Virgin Shops in June. Have you ever thought about 
I'd love to go into space. Cheers. Um, cheers. I'm a born optimist and you know, a very positive person. Ryan. Yes, Sir Richard. Just try to be yourself. Okay. Both my children have inherited that from me. And I was very lucky, I had a very happy childhood. Now, you shouldn't think, Archbishop. <laughs> Just go. One of the things I enjoy the most is teaching people to swim. It's wonderfully satisfying to help them stand on their own two feet. Oh, brilliant. Why do you have so much money? <laughs> the exciting thing about learning to be an entrepreneur is then later on in life you can be creating not-for-profit businesses, not-for-profit things to try to deal with the problems of the world. I've been lucky enough to you know, help create The Elders, which is a wonderful group of people that are trying to tackle conflict resolution issues in the world. The Elders can become a fiercely independent and robust force for good. The Oceanic Elders to try to tackle the problems of the oceans, the Carbon Warum to try to tackle climate change. is to give everything I can to solve the problem. I get enormous satisfaction trying to achieve something that has never been achieved before. The wonderful thing about Virgin Orbit is it literally can help transform people's lives around the world. I've always been a dreamer. My mum taught me to never give up and to reach for the stars. Praise to all, all the people around me. It's screw it, just get on and do it. Welcome to space. If we can do this, just imagine what you can do. Good morning, Sir Richard Branson. Uh, good morning. Um, it was a uh, delight to talk to you, delight to hear Mike talking as well, and uh, congratulations to him on his uh, pledge, which uh, uh, is, is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Now, I've got a question for both of you. I'm not sure if you've actually met in person, but um, we've got more than 250 young Australian climate tech startup founders here. Actually, some of them aren't so young with us today here in Sydney. What is the role of entrepreneurs in solving climate change? And what advice would you both give to climate tech startups and innovators that are looking to scale faster and further than any tech startups have done before them. So, Richard, we might start with you, please. Um, potentially, uh, one, one of them could uh, come up with a way of actually um, sorting out the problem completely. I mean, that, you know, so, uh, so I think they need to sort of think, think big and, and think, you know, I mean, could we, I don't know, uh, use, our, use technology to take carbon out of the atmosphere and put it to the bottom, the very bottom of the ocean. Uh, obviously, you'd need, to, you'd need to make sure that it was environmentally sound, but they, they, just, they just need to think, you know, like collect, collecting carbon out of the atmosphere and, uh, and storing it is, is, is something which is being done. Um, you know, simple things like, you know, if, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough to live on an island. Um, I know that uh, tech entrepreneurs can make our island 25% more efficient mm. by just, mm. you know, um, making it a bit more tech savvy than it currently is. And I think, you know, there, there's a, there's enormous amount of savings that can be done in in Australia uh, by by tech entrepreneurs in, in in just reducing the amount of waste that that is done every single mm. day. Um, so, uh, you know, th th this is the this is the biggest challenge of our lifetime and. Uh, we, we need tech on, entrepreneurs everywhere to just put, put their mind to trying to, uh, trying to solve it. Indeed. I'd just like to pick up on that point. I mean, we already have most of the technology we need. Innovation and invention will take us a bit further. So thanks for, for mentioning that, Richard. Mike, what are your thoughts and what would your advice be to the tech startups here with us today? Um, even, in the, even in the field of climate change and... Um, 
and the like, I would say that they should focus on the customer experience, right? Uh, and, and the reason for that is we have a lot of great technologies. What we need is to accelerate the rollout of those technologies to making an impact in the very short term. Yeah. And when you're talking about the rollout of technologies, it is uh, often about finance and the customer experience and things like that. And what it is, if you tell people to do the right thing, it's generally very hard. If you show them that doing the right thing can be cheaper and they can have a better experience of whatever it is that they're doing, uh, then um, I, I think it will accelerate the rollout, right? We should focus very much on the speed and urgency with which we can get these technologies into people's lives, uh, businesses, you know, countries, whatever it is. Um, and that that speed of rollout is often about experience, right? We want these to be pulled. We want them to, to love this and see it as a great uh, uh, change. Uh, I argue that all the time with Tesla cars. So people buy Tesla cars, they buy them because they're just a better car, right? They don't buy them because it's green. They buy them because they're quiet, because mm -hmm. they've got a great sound system yep. and all this other stuff that happens yep. to have an effect that they save the planet while they're doing that. And um, for whatever industry they're in, focus on that, that customer experience and, and get the, the rollout accelerated. Mike, we'll just stay there, with you for is, a moment. There is a company in um, New Zealand called uh, Lanza Tech that we, we've um, been working with for many years. Um, and you know, the, 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 there they had a, sort of a, a, a breakthrough idea, which was, can we take the waste product that goes up steel plants or aluminium plants and turn it into jet aviation fuel. And um, it's taken, you know, much longer than they thought, um, but it but it is now happening. And so, you know, it's also, I think, thinking thinking about sort of big, great breakthrough ideas like that uh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, we're, you know, we're looking forward with our airline to be able to, you know, power it with with Lanzatech fuel in, in, in future years and, or, or other, other breakthrough technologies that that may some of these techs uh, on engineers who are listening may come up with. Mike, I'll just come back to you. In this country, we've got this sort of rather silly ideological divide between the policy makers, uh, the tech community, the sustainability community. What can we do to bridge this divide? Uh, Look, Richard probably can help here. Uh, uh, no, it's it is a tough question. The, the UK is actually one of the nations that's done this the best. If you look yeah. at their you know twenty, thirty, even forty year history, um, we we don't have popular opinion is vastly in favour of taking more action on these types of issues. The challenge is we have to transform our economy. We have to actually do some work to transform the economy. Um, in our case, we have long been an exporter of energy in the form of fossil fuels. We're the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world. 90% of the climate change problem is solved by moving us technologically off fossil fuels onto non-fossil fuel based technologies. This is a challenge for our economy and we have to be honest with people, whether they're a, a worker in those industries or whether it's a business, we have to be honest and say we are going to take action to move away from those technologies. Uh, the globe is going to move there if we don't, but we have to have an understanding that that can be a very positive thing for our economy and for jobs and for GDP. And all the studies and surveys show this. We have great opportunities, but we, we have to get away from our um, ideological connection to fossil fuels in our economy. We can be an energy exporter. We can just do it in different ways. Uh, the UK has bat battled with this for many, many years, but done a really good job, especially over the last 10 plus years. They're, they're leading the world in a lot of ways in this uh, transition. Indeed, they are. Richard, would you like to add to that? Uh, just, just to completely agree, I think I mean Australia um, can be uh, a, a fantastic exporter of clean energy. Uh, it can power itself on clean energy. Um, uh, I think maybe the only thing I would add is that um, you know it, it is difficult to persuade governments in Australia to, to levy a carbon tax. Um, but maybe something like a carbon clean energy dividend where every, every company puts aside a certain amount of money like Mike has done to invest in, in, in clean energy, basically, depending on how much carbon they're emitting. So, you know, something like Virgin Australia would have to put quite a lot of money aside um, to invest in, in, in investing clean energy project. Um, and, uh, but they would have the chance of, you know, getting that money back um, through their investments. And if, if every company was asked to do that, enormous amounts of money would then 
uh, be invested in Australia in, in trying to create a, a clean energy revolution. Richard, you've said before that coal mining disappeared in the UK many decades ago and that coal miners have moved on to new jobs that are far more pleasant, less dangerous and better for everyone's health. You know, currently in Australia, we've got this debate around how long the coal industry will last for. What's your take on how fast Australia can transition away from coal to renewable energy? <laughs> uh... You know, you just have to ask the politicians whether they're going to be brave enough just to do it. And, 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 um, yeah. and you know, they, they, it, it obviously has to be done. I mean, like, the, the um, uh, coal is, is the number one uh, problem that the world has. And the, the coal-powered state power, power, power stations that China still has um, is do, are, are doing tr tremendous damage. So, um, you know, so I think a good, a good government in Australia would try to you know, um, work out a, a way of, uh, of, you know, creating jobs for all those people who are working in the coal industry, as has happened in, in the UK and, uh, and other countries. And, um, and, th and I think they would have a much better, better life than they currently have mm. going down a coal mine. Indeed. Mike, we know your position on coal. It's the same as mine. It's the same as everyone else here in the audience. Uh, we need to get off it quickly. Um, Mike, is there anything else that we can learn from the UK that, that you're looking at that we could bring back here down under to, you know, take, take a lead from Boris Johnson and his, his government? Uh, look, they, they did a very good job at this transition. I think, I think one of the things they really did is, is stop romanticising the, the past, right? We should celebrate the past. It built a lot of Australia's prosperity today and we should celebrate ourselves for that. Now that we know its effects... <laughs> And now that we know what it is and we have other alternatives, we have to take stronger action to move, move away from mm -hmm. that. Otherwise, our customers are going to do that, right? If you look at all of their international announcements and goals and targets, they're all going to move away from us anyway. So we're just going to drive into a brick wall if we don't mm -hmm. start doing that, that transition ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the, the second thing is we, we need to divorce in Australia very much mining from fossil fuels. It's often wrapped in this sense of, oh, you're anti-mining. And it's like, whoa, hang on a second. No, mining is necessary. Australia can profit from iron, yep. uh, iron ore, steel, <laughs> copper, zinc, rare earth, metal, silver. We have everything the world needs to build all of these renewable technologies. Mm -hmm. So our mining industry will do fantastically well if we yep. transition it even, even further away from <laughs> fossil fuels. So yep. separating those two is really yep. important because they often put them together on purpose. Indeed, we had Twiggy Forrest yesterday evening talking about green hydrogen and, and green steel. So, indeed. Richard, I, I think I know the question or I know the answer to this next question. You know, you know the question. I know the question. <laughs> I know the question. I've just moved on the slide in front of me. I know, the, I know your answer, I think. Are you optimistic that we can solve this and prevent a catastrophe? Um, I'm, I'm a born optimist, um, and I think that maybe this year has seen a, 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 turn, a turning point in, in global um, opinion on this. I, mean, I think people now are really, really realising that the world yeah. is facing a catastrophe, and, um, and that's taken, I think, a while to really sink in. Um, you've got entrepreneurs all over the world, um, you know, spending a lot of their time and energy trying to deal with it. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's tech entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs who, who, who can help solve this problem. So um, I'm optimistic, but there's a hell of a lot of work to do. And we're, we're definitely, you know, behind the curve at the moment. I don't have the next question, but to wrap up, um, what do both of you hope to see at the end of this two weeks of COP discussions in Glasgow? Mike, we might start with you. Um, look, on a, on a local level here in Australia, I hope that we raise the awareness amongst the Australian population of our historically regressive role in all of these climate negotiations and how our economy is actually uh, a negative force, but how it could be a positive force, the opportunities we have, right? If, if COP can cause the Australian population to be much more aware of our role, negative and positive opportunities, challenges, um, then I think that will be really really positive for our role in the in the problem. On a global level, there's some part of that awareness that everyone's going to have to take. Um, and obviously, I hope we get to agreements on uh, ending the majority of coal usage by 2030. We've done some good things on deforestation and that we get together and move forward. 
um, it is a it is a huge challenge. But I, I'm hopeful that <clears throat> there are very smart people there trying to to work hard to come to some sort of global compact that'll that'll move us forward, and we'll try again next year. Thank you. And Richard, any final words from you? Um, I, I agree on everything he's just said. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, how, what a wonderful challenge for, say, an Australian government to, uh, to, to, to try to transform their economy in, in a really positive way. Um, you know, to plant forests where, you know, where forests can be planted, to, uh, you know, to do some, you know, to really, really make Australia um, an example to the world of, of um, you know, what can be done. And, um, and with, you know, people uh, that are sitting watching this program, working with the government, um, yeah, I think it, it could be a very, very exciting future. But we just need, uh, we need the government to really, t you know, take, t t you know, work with, with industry to make it really happen. Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.